I'm with Interscope Research, and we're a company located in Boston, and that's exactly what we do. We work with customers to help them measure what's going on with media and, and optimize it. It's very interesting to see the huge advances in neuroscience that have come basically in the past couple of decades. We're getting to the point where we can actually measure the brain while it's operating and see how it works. And certainly, the traditional tools do not work all that well. So if you look at you know, the number of product introductions per, per year um, and the total, about 70, between 70 and 80% of them fail, meaning people are launching the wrong product, targeted at the wrong market. They're not understanding how people are actually thinking. Um, and let me talk a little bit about Interscope Research. Interscope Research was started about two years ago, actually originally by a psychiatrist from Harvard named Carl Marcy. Very smart guy, he's a Rhodes Scholar. And he was studying empathy between doctors and patients. And empathy between doctors and patients is, is really the study of, is the doctor emotionally matching what's going on in the patient? And he, he came up with a whole bunch of techniques with that, started working with a guy named Sandy Pentland, who's at the Media Lab at MIT. Uh, actually on a smart badge technology, so, that, so it's a badge that you wear. It listens to what you say. It doesn't actually look at the words, but it actually measures your, your emotional state. And the goal of that project was to detect depression in people. So people who are prone to depression, using the badge to actually see whether they were becoming depressed or not. Uh, and they bumped into another guy who got an MBA from MIT named Brian Levine. And he's, he actually was one of the people behind developing the Major League Baseball website. So by putting together the neuroscience, the emotion, and the study of websites, how to make effective websites, they put together a company about two years ago and started working really on the hypothesis of can you use these neuromarketing techniques to measure people's engagement to media? And if so, can you use that to optimize, to make media more effective? And fortunately, they found the answer to that question was yes. Now, let me show you kind of the old paradigm of decision making. This is really straight out of Descartes. And it's called, we call it the think, do, feel model. So you think about what you want to do, you make a decision, you do it, and based on the results of what you just did, you said, oh, that was a good thing to do, that was a bad thing, and you learn. Um, now, it would be nice if this were the case, but it's, it's actually completely wrong. Now, that's not to say our rational mind can't influence our unconscious mind, but um, what is it? About 60% of Americans are overweight. Um, you know, 90% of people who try to lose weight fail. Clearly, if thinking about something um, was enough to influence your behavior, we'd be able to do a lot of things. You know, if your boss is saying something annoying to you, uh, you want to be nice to them. Um, I'm the kind of person I always have to speak my mind. Uh, it hasn't always been um, to my advantage, I have to say. Um, it's very hard to break the habit of, uh, of my, uh, my emotional mind. And yet when we're developing products, we use cognitive instruments to try to measure people's satisfaction with them. And uh, this always takes me to an experience I had a, a while ago. Um, so we're designing a, a a product, actually, uh, it's a company I worked at called CyberGold, and it was the first pay for performance advertising uh, product on the internet back in 1996. So that was a, a long time ago. And uh, we're designing product to try to get people as efficiently as through the process of doing something an advertiser wanted them to do so we, sh we could get paid. And we're running a focus group, and uh, I'm there behind the two way mirror watching people use our product, and a guy's sitting there using the product, and, um, and he's stuck. And there's a bright yellow button on the screen. I and mean, we knew a little bit about usability back in those days, right? I mean, I've, you know, I've read Donald Norman books. I've sat down with Jacob Nielsen. I know who Tog is, if any of you guys know who, uh, who that is. And uh, so it's something that's important to me. And the guy sitting there, and I, I asked the moderator, I say, is this glass soundproof? And he said, he said yeah, it's, it's soundproof. I said, no, no, I mean, really, is it really soundproof? He's, yeah, it's really soundproof. And I was so upset. I'm like, push the button, press, press the button. It was, a big, you know, it was big, it was yellow, it was right there in the screen. The guy was sitting there confused about what to do next. Now, obviously, that is not the user's fault. 
Um, and as a product designer and someone who's, who's, who's run my fair share of marketing campaigns, I realize when someone doesn't get the message you're trying to deliver to them, it's not their fault. It's that you haven't built the product, you haven't written the right messages in a way that it gets through their brain. And a lot of times the mistake is you're trying to appeal to their thinking brain um, as opposed to their feeling brain. And that's something we're gonna talk about um, soon. And so, but people continue. They run focus groups, they do surveys, they do this person with a dial that's a dial test for, uh, for TV ads and video, right? You sit there and as you're watching, you're supposed to, if you like something, you turn the dial up, and if you don't like it, you turn the dial down. Um, these are all cognitive measures. These are all measures that require your, your conscious thinking mind to work, and they do not do very well for most questions around changing people's habits. And that's really the key. So um, there's actually a great book by a guy named Neil Martin called Habit. Uh, it's a pretty short book. Um, and it's about how people, customers get entrenched in, the habit, in their habits. And it's very hard to change their habits. Um, here at Google, you guys are developing a great habit in people, which is the habit of going to Google for all of their searches. That's a great habit. And as your competitors know, it's very hard to get people to change that habit. Um, but one thing he, he noticed is that if you survey people um, right after they change their cell phone service, 85% of them say that they're satisfied or very satisfied with their prior cell phone service. Um, you know, that sort of blows me away. Um, he actually did his PhD thesis, and he noticed that when you survey people, their satisfaction with a product as they report with their thinking brain by filling out a survey, that only represents 8% of their actual repurchase of that product. So in other words, saying I really like something explains less than 10% of actually buying it again. Um, and this is the kind of thing that advances in neuroscience have really helped us with. with. This is um, someone with their head stuck in an fMRI scanner. And so an fMRI scanner can actually watch people's brains while they're working. Now this stuff is all very early. I mean, we're really just now starting to tease apart, tease apart what parts of brain, the brain are responsible for which things, how they work, how they work in concert to make decisions and those kinds of things. But there are starting to be practical applications. Now one of the challenges is um, for most people who are developing marketing campaigns, um, they really can't afford to stick people in fMRI scanners. Uh, it's just way too expensive. You can only do one person at a time. And so what we've come up with at Interscope is a way of reading people's emotional brains very uh, inexpensively. And that's something that is very important. Um, because what neuroscience has figured out is that emotions are what drive us. Um, I put the dog up here because in a very dramatic circumstance, it's, it's obvious that your emotions drive something, right? If you're walking down the street, and a dog leaps out at you and starts barking, you stop, you hunker down, you might run, um, but whatever conscious thought you were having goes out of your mind. But what neuroscience has really shown us is that in fact, everything we do is filtered by our emotions first. So literally, what you see and what you pay attention to is filtered by your emotional state. Um, an example I like to use is uh, you're driving to work, um, you're tired, you're mad, you got a meeting, you're late, you're upset, and someone comes, you, cuts you off on the highway, you're gonna have a certain behavior and a certain reaction to that. Um, if you're feeling good, you're well rested, you're happy, if someone sort of cuts in front of you, you'll have a very different reaction. Um, and so actually what you see and what you experience is 100% influenced by how you're feeling and the interesting discovery in neuroscience is that this happens on a second-by-second -second basis. And this is exactly what we can measure at Interscope, is on a second-by-second -second basis, essentially, what is your emotional state? Now, I won't do too much brain science here, but I figured it's worth doing a, a little bit. Uh, this is um, a diagram of your brain, of course, and on the outside is your cortex. Uh, and the cortex does a, a lot of different things, but part of what it does is cognition. That's your, your thinking brain 
is wrapped around this old reptilian brain. Um, I just showed the limbic system here. Um, actually kind of down toward the bottom is the cerebellum. That's also uh, is, is, is part of your emotional machinery. Um, this brain system, the limbic system, was actually a very successful system. Um, it became to, came to prominence in reptiles. And if you remember, um, dinosaurs ruled the Earth for about 135 million years. Uh, this is the system that influences what you remember, uh, what you pay attention to, and, um, and they've done all kinds of great experiments with mice showing that, for example, um, in the uh, amygdala, which is the part over there, um, you can actually inject chemicals into a rat as they're, as they're performing a task that will make them remember that task better. And uh, you can also inject chemicals in there to make them not remember uh, what they just did. And if you think about it, as someone developing a new product or developing an advertising campaign, what you want people to do is remember and to change their behavior. And so this is the part of the brain that you have to engage to get people to change their behavior. And again, just going back to the weight loss example, thinking about it doesn't work for habitual behaviors like buying things, like using products. Things you want people to use every day, that's a habit. That is not something that happens in their thinking brain. It happens in this part of their brain. So let's move on to what we do at Interscope. So we measure something we call engagement. And engagement is attention to something that has emotional impact. And we'll tell you what emotional impact means, but there's really two components of this. One is you have to be paying attention to it, and the other is that it has to have uh, an emotional impact on you. And we measure this using a very simple system. Excuse me. Uh, we put a vest on people. Uh, it's a very lightweight vest. Uh, it's wireless, so it has a little box on the front that wirelessly transmits data to a PC. And it measures four things. It measures how fast you're breathing, uh, basically the change in your heart rate, so is your heart rate going up or is your heart rate going down, measures how much you're moving, are you leaning forward, are you turning around, and it measures uh, what's called galvanic skin response, but how much are you sweating. And this is a system that can very accurately measure your emotional engagement to things. And there's a very concrete reason for that. Um, which makes this superior to uh, a bunch of other brain measurement technologies that are really focused on the cortex. Things like EEG, you know, that basically measure around your head. Those are measuring your cortex. This measures your deep brain because it turns out if you look at where these outputs go, um, they go out to your peripheral nervous system. So, um, and, and you know, feel free to read this yourself, but, but basically all of these measures are things that are reflected deeply by your emotional state. And this is something that is very logical. So if you heard a gunshot behind you, everyone in this room, we'd all turn around, we'd all start sweating, our heart rate would go up, and we might stop breathing for a little while, hold our breath. And we'd all do that. That's something that we'd all do um, pretty much at the same time. But it turns out, again, going to this point that your emotions are driving you all the time, it's much more subtle. So on a second-by-second -second basis, for example, uh, these parameters are changing. So for example, if you're looking at pictures of something that's pleasing, so people smiling, babies, things like that, your heart rate actually goes up slightly. And if you're looking at pictures of things that are un unpleasant, so someone frowning, rotting food, things like that, your heart rate actually goes down slightly. And so this really is something that on a second-by-second -second basis, you can figure out people's level of uh, emotional arousal. Now, you guys have an algorithm here, um, and we have an algorithm too. And this is our, our algorithm. So our measure of engagement, which is the thing on the far side, um, that's composed of two things. It's composed of something we call synchrony and intensity. Now, it turns out when you're measuring emotion, it's not very reliable to measure it just in one person. So what we do is we measure groups of people experiencing, for the most part, the same thing at the same time. So they can be watching video, they can be paging through a virtual magazine and we'll time sync when they're all looking at the same page. Um, they can be doing a, a web experience. And um, 
Hi. <laughs> uh, you guys had hackers here at uh, Inside Google. Um, and uh, so it can be a web experience. Uh, and again, we, we match up when they're looking at the same thing uh, at the same time. Uh, I'm not doing anything wrong here. I think. OK, good. Nice to, nice to meet you. Um, and, uh, and, and what we've done by doing a bunch of scientific research is we figured out it, it typically takes a group of about 20 people to reliably measure on a second by second people's emotional engagement um, to media. And, and how their signals go together, that's the synchrony component. So again, if there's a gunshot in the back of the room, at the same time, we would all do the same thing. Um, if people are watching a video experience that's engaging, uh, their parameters will tend to change at the same time. Now, the reason you can't measure it in one person is because um, you could be sitting here looking at something on the screen and think, oh, I've got an appointment in 15 minutes. I have to go. Suddenly, you know, your stress level will go up. Your, you know, these parameters start to change. And that's because, obviously, your brain is working on a lot of things all at the same time. But if you do it across a relatively small audience, you get a very, very reliable, reliable signal. Um, in terms of this emotional engagement piece. And let me show, show you how it works in an actual product. So this is, a, um, this is a video of a Heineken commercial. And it's called The Weasel. And the blue bar over here is the audience's level of emotional engagement. So this was 20 people sitting down and watching this commercial actually as part of, live, as part of a television reel. So the way we test things like video commercials is we just people basically sit down and watch TV. They put on the vest. We get them hooked up to the machine. We establish a baseline. And they just sit there and watch TV. They only have to be exposed to, to this once. And it's a completely natural experience. The vest is wireless, so people can you know, get up and go to the bathroom and sit on the couch. And uh, actually, uh, when we measured the Super Bowl, people got one beer a quarter. They sit there eating potato chips and, uh, and that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, it's a very relaxed um, environment. So let's see if I can uh, get this to play here. There we go. So you can see the engagement rising. This Pretty interesting, right? I mean, you know, as it goes, as the story progresses, people's engagement in the ad goes up, gets to the height of the story when he has the refrigerator open, he takes the beer, and, uh, and then really nothing else goes on in the story, so down engagement goes again. Um, now, this was an ad that we analyzed as part of a, a big study by the Advertising Research Foundation. So they took a number of advertisements from a bunch of different companies, and they had all different people look at how measuring different ways of how engaging the content was. And that included doing um, post-test surveys on these ads. So, so how memorable the ads and what was people's attitude toward them. So, so this particular ad had very high likability. People liked it but very few people remembered it. Um, and it has a decent pattern of emotional engagement. But if it, and, and that's just the, the pattern of engagement through the ad, right? It rises to the joke, and then it uh, comes back down. But there's a, there's a very interesting reason. If you hook people up to eye trackers and have them watch the commercial, you can see why people don't remember this commercial very well. And let me just show you. I'm just going to show you eye tracking data from the height of the joke, which is, over on the left-hand side of the screen, at, again, at the height of the joke, when people are at their maximum emotional engagement, they're looking at the generic beer. And that's why this ad does not work. Because when your engagement is high, you're not paying attention to the important message. And this is what we see. And, and honestly, this is, a, this is a place where eye-tracking data can lead you quite far astray. And I'll show more examples of this as I, as I go through. But um, you, can, you can spend time looking at something, but have no emotional reaction to it, and therefore you won't remember it. Um, or, obviously, you can be looking at the wrong place um, at the wrong time. So let me talk a little bit about validation. I mean, it's great you can measure this stuff. It's, it's cool that you can show an example of one. Um, but it seems a little bit far-fetched to think, OK, let me get this straight. How fast my heart is beating how fast I'm breathing, whether I'm moving or not, that really is going to measure how well I remember something deep in my brain. That seems a little far-fetched to me. 
So, so we spent a lot of time doing validation studies, and these are all things that we're, we're happy to share. I think that's one thing that's very important in a new and emerging industry is to be, be out there and show that your stuff works. And that's something we're, we're very happy to do. Um, we actually recently finished a joint study with TiVo. And TiVo has a panel of 100,000 users who have opted in. So they, they, they allow TiVo to look at their, what they're viewing and on a second by second basis when they're fast forwarding, you know, what they've chosen to record, sort of all the relevant TiVo parameters. Again, this is an opt-in panel that TiVo has. And so we had a hypothesis. And our hypothesis was that if an ad is really engaging, people will watch it. And if an ad isn't very engaging, based on our measure, on our algorithm, they'll fast forward. So that's the supposition. So, so this is a graph of the TiVo data. So what, what we had people do is they sat down and they watched TV for an hour and a half. That's it. That was their experience. So they didn't know they would be testing for ads or for emotional engagement or whatever. They put on the vest, they sit down, and they watch live TV. Um, so, and of course, our panel was watching the same channel. We, what we did was we took the people at TiVo who were watching the same channel at the same time and matched their fast forwarding behavior to our emotional engagement measure. So this, is just, this, is taking out, this is, doesn't show the show. This is just showing the different ads in the different ad pods across the show. And this is, the, this is a measure of TiVo fast forwarding. So it's the number of people who, who watch the entire ad. So, so if, the number of, if people start fast forwarding, the number of people viewing the entire ad goes down. And if people stay, the number of people watching goes back up. And, and I'll just lay over our measure of emotional engagement. Um, so that's, again, our second by second measure of emotional engagement for these commercials. So it is the case that when people are not engaged in an ad, they pick up the remote and fast forward. You had a question. So the, the TiVo population and the best population were independent? Completely independent. And they just happen to be watching the same channel at the same time. We also did a study with NBC looking at channel changing behavior. So when were people likely to change channels? Basically the same results. So if people are highly engaged, they're unlikely to change the channel. If their engagement is low, they're highly likely to change the channel. Um, another one we did, um, and this was a, a, an example where we can compare against some of the other ways that data is collected, is with the Super Bowl. So we had people watch the Super Bowl. As I mentioned, they got, if they wanted, they got up to, you know, they could have a beer a quarter, no more than that. Um, and we picked the top five most engaging ads from the Super Bowl. What are the ads that we thought were most engaging? Um, and USA Today does a, they do a dial test. So they have people sit down and watch with the dial. Um, that's the one in the middle. And they pick their list of the top, the most engaging commercials. This is the Super Bowl in 2008. Um, and then there was an EEG company that published their data on what they thought were the top five most engaging ads. So the hypothesis here is that if emotions matter, the emotional measurement should be more predictive of online buzz than the dial, which is a cognitive measure, and of EEG, which is predominantly, as I understand it, a cognitive measure. So that's the hypothesis. So what we did, this was 2008, so what we did was we looked at the number of views of these commercials on MySpace. And again, the hypothesis being that the most emotionally engaging ads according to the Interscope measurement should get more views and more comments than the dial test or the EEG. Um, and in fact, that is the case. So this was, this was over a, roughly a nine month period looking at total views. Now, there are a couple interesting things about this. Um, one is that the dial test is a market mover. So USA Today advertises their results, right? They're reported in all the papers, they're in the New York Times, they're obviously in USA Today. Um, so people go and see the ads that they think are the top ads automatically. So it is, it is a market mover. Um, and the other thing that I think is really interesting about this is their sample size is more than 10 times our sample size. So our sample size for 2008 was only 20 people. Um, and that really is a key to this emotional measurement technology. Like with TiVo, the way we create value is we say we can measure a small number of people and that measurement is going to reliably scale up to a large number of people. 
And that's the key, really the key to the emotional engagement piece, is that, is that you do a small study, that scales up to behavior in the large. And if you're really interested in, in sort of the more sort of techie version of it, this is basically the correlation. So what's the correlation between online views and online comments and our measurements, the dial test? Um, we also compared against self-report. So this was a study, and I actually, I don't, actually don't remember what the N on the self-report is, um, of people rating the ads themselves. Which ads did they like the most? Um, and again, this is the one where your cognitive brain is not a great predictor of your behavior. So asking if you like someone, this is just like repurchase. This is just like switching your cell phone customer. This is just like sitting someone down in front of your product and saying, did you really like that? Did you, you know, are you going to buy it? Are you going to use it? Those things, those things are very poor predictors or, I mean, they're somewhat predictive. Let's, let's be fair. They are somewhat predictive, but they're not as good as your uh, emotional system. And again, the reason why, sir? Uh, is this on? Yeah. Uh, question. Yeah would be, did, um, it's typical to measure whether people remember an ad, right? Yes. Did you do that? Yeah, we do. We do do post-test recall. And, and it's, it's very highly correlated. So going back to the, um, uh, the Heineken commercial, again, we would do post-test recall. Do they remember the Heineken ad? Um, but really what you want to get to, again, is their behavior. And Actually, another ad that we did in that series was a Burger King ad, or it was actually two Burger King ads. And the in-market performance of those two Burger King ads was known. So it was known ahead of time which one did well in the marketplace and drove behavior and which one didn't. Um, and our measure of emotional engagement, again, the one that we said had the, we measured high emotional engagement in, was the one that had better in-market performance. So, so and actually, recall can be important. Right? That's kind of this interaction between your cognitive brain and your emotional brain. Meaning, if your cognitive brain doesn't remember the features and the brand, and that was you know, the phone you saw at the AT&T store, it's going to be tough for your emotional brain to get you to the AT&T store to buy it. So um, you, you definitely need both of those things together. And really what we're saying is that this measure of emotional engagement from your, from your kind of more primitive reptilian brain is actually what drives your memory. Meaning if you're not engaged, you won't remember. And if you are engaged, you will remember. That's really the key to all this. Um, let me talk a little bit about print advertising, because that ties right to the web, right? The web is a, is a relatively static experience in the sense that you look at a page, you try to figure it out, and um, something happens. So this was, this was a, a Honda commercial, now, or this was a Saturn commercial. Now, now this particular one, um, we did ourselves. So Saturn, we, we didn't do this in conjunction with Saturn. And the next one I'm going to show you is a, is a Honda ad. And we didn't do that in conjunction with Honda. These are just things that we measured uh, independently um, ourselves. And you can see the ad on the left-hand side of the screen. So it's this ad. It's rethink safety. So the message of the, of the ad is, I would say, Saturn makes safe cars. And what we do is we put together eye tracking data. So we take the heat map from the eye tracker. And when people are looking at certain spots on the screen, we can measure both their cognitive engagement to the content by looking essentially at their pupil dilation. Because that's a measure essentially of how much cognitive processing are you doing? Are you thinking about something? And the red is, is what comes out of the vest. Are you having an emotional reaction to what you are seeing or reading? And what you want to see in an effective ad is you want to see both cognitive processing and you want to see emotional processing. You want to see those two things together. And that really gets to your question, right? You want, to, you want something to happen in your conscious brain, um, but your emotional brain is going to drive that ability to remember what that thing is. And so this ad, um, uh, sort of down here over in this part of the screen, um, people, the white circle is what we call um, is what we call a disconnect. That means you're looking, but you're neither having a cognitive reaction nor an emotional reaction. And typically, we see that in two circumstances. One is the copy is very generic, right? So it's a, like, it, like if, you, if you do phrases that are trite, that people have seen before, they'll just disconnect, right? They'll just zone over it. And, and that's actually what you see up over in the corner with the Saturn logo, right? People have seen it before. It's not in any kind of context. They see it. They recognize it. But nothing happens. And when they get down to rethink safe, some cognitive processing is going on, but there's no emotional reaction to that. Somehow that content is not resonating with them. Um, now, 
hopefully in another 10 years, you know, with advances in brain science, we'll be able to tell you even more about that going on. But this is something where you can see that there is a problem. And in fact, where people, where you see the, the red circle overlapping the blue circle over there in the lower uh, left of the ad, um, it was with the miles per gallon. So um, not necessarily the message they want to get through. Um, this is a Honda ad. And this uses a very, I would call it a cheap uh, emotional trick. Um, uh, and I'm not sure they even knew that they were doing it, but it uses chocolate. So chocolate creates an emotional reaction in a lot of people. And in this case, it works. So you can see them, you know, people look at the ad, they take in the cupcakes, they have a very uh, emotional reaction to it. You know, some of the cupcakes, it's really just emotional. I mean, they're really not, you know, they're not having any sort of cognitive reaction to that. And so they're essentially primed. When they get to the word crave, they have a very strong reaction. And this is something you see all the time. And, and advertisers kind of, you know, they really know how to tap into the stuff already, right? I mean, celebrity endorsements are a great example, right? If you're a golfer, you see Tiger Woods, you see him with the golf club, you're going to have an emotional reaction because that's someone that you, that you like. Um, it, there's been a lot of controversy, actually, as people look at this stuff, and, and whether using attractive people sells product. And, um, and actually, it's interesting because that's, that's a, a question we can start to tease apart. And let me show you some catalog covers we did. Um, these are not the actual catalog covers because the client um, didn't want, want us to use their name and everything. But these, uh, we created the synthetic catalog cover behind it that looks very much like uh, the original. So, um, so this is one using two attractive women. Um, now, you know, they probably didn't do this consciously, but they're trying to essentially create an emotional reaction in you, get you to pay attention to the copy by having someone attractive. Um, and if you look at the one on the left, uh, where she's sort of in the fitness outfit, you'll notice that, um, well, f the first thing you'll notice probably is that you look at her face, right? People who are viewing this stuff always look at faces. And that's something we have a special part of our brain for processing faces. So anytime you put a face in something that's above a certain size, people will look at it and people will almost always have an emotional reaction to it. Um, and, um, and so you can see that happening, right? People look at her face and they have an emotional reaction. But they really don't make it from her face over to the content. But in the other ad, what has happened is they've wrapped the, the content they want you to read around her face. And so as your eye moves to process her face, you become engaged. You're very close to the copy. And so you actually have an emotional reaction. So although it's the same copy, right, it's not a copy problem, it's a way of designing an ad so that you have more emotional engagement to it. And this is kind of a best practices thing. And we see this in video ads. You know, we can talk about this in video ads and print ads and, and uh, those kinds of things. But it's, it's very interesting. And there are a whole bunch of techniques that you can learn from emotional processing on things to do. Like a great example is if you're watching video ads, um, anytime there's a relationship between people, something happens between people, people's engagement always goes up. So, um, you know, we were analyzing some videos with cars, and this is actually, I, I've been in this company about three and a half months, so I'm, I'm pretty new here at Interscope. But it was, it was literally my first week, I was looking at some of our results, and we were analyzing some car commercials, and every time a bunch of people went and jumped into a car together, people's engagement would just shoot through the roof. And I'm thinking, that is not the interesting part of the ad, right? There are people dancing, there are people singing, and suddenly it's like the end of the ad, and they get in the car, and that's when people suddenly become engaged, even though there's great music and celebrities and all these kinds of things. And it's because we're programmed to pay attention to relationships. When something's happening, when we see two people talking, when we see people get together, we pay attention. And so that's something that you can leverage in terms of your products and your advertising to create um, an emotional engagement. Let me talk a little bit about the, the web. Um, we, do, we do some stuff with companies on, um, on kind of user experience. We're, it's, it's something that um, we're really focused on more in terms of people who are doing launches of big products and things like that. And that's, that's another thing to take away from this emotional processing stuff is um, you can optimize things by sitting on a pile of data and analyzing it. But a lot of times if you're, say, creating a, a new ad or a movie or something or a new product, you're investing a lot of money in developing that product. And so you, you, know, you need the launch to, to go well. I mean, with advertising, that's very true, right? I mean, people literally spend millions of dollars developing commercials um, and then they have to go place them in the market and see how they do. So the cost of making a mistake is 
expensive. Um, tweaking your text ad on Google AdWords, not so important. I'm, I'm sure you could learn something about that from emotional, en from emotional engagement research, but, but not so important. So most of the work we do with clients on the web is when they're going to launch a new site and they're really curious about how people are interacting with the content. Um, and is it resonating? Because, because you can have people engage in behaviors, but when someone clicks, they may click because it's something they want to do, or they may click because they're confused and they don't really know what's going on. And that's really the kind of thing that we can determine. So this is, this is um, uh, again, a, a synthetic ad that is very similar to the actual content that we did for an actual, um, it, it was one of the top three uh, uh, consumer packaged goods companies um, and a, a site that they have. Um, and so the first thing we looked at them was, was the navigation. So as people read the navigation, what was their reaction to the words? And this is really a copy question, right? Are the right words being used? Are words being used that, that emotionally engage their target, target audience? Because that's another key to design these studies, right? You need the right target audience, the people who are actually interested in using this product. If you take, um, you know, this one is not for, um, the, the Heineken, I think we did, um, you know, beer drinkers, you know, 21 to 28, uh, you know, male beer drinkers. That was who was viewing the Heineken commercial. That's their demographic. For this website, you probably wouldn't get good data out of using that same, um, that same demographic. So, so what you can see from this is that you know, some of the navigation people cognitively process, but they don't really react to it. Um, some of the navigation people don't really understand what it means, kind of like this stuff. Some people are having an emotional reaction to it, but again, they're not really cognitively processing. So, so we recommended that they basically tweak the actual words they were using on the stuff to make it clear which sections of the site people were going to. Um, this, is the, this is the heat map from the eye tracker. And so if you're using the eye tracker, you're thinking, well, hey, we're actually getting pretty good coverage. People are reading the various areas of the site. They're looking. This thing will probably perform pretty well. But if you look at their emotional engagement at the same time, and, and, um, and look down here where it says, you know, maximize your style. Look, look what happens. When you see that, they're looking, but, but you're not seeing the blue circle and the red circle overlapping. You're not seeing both things. So they're looking. They're having some, some reaction to that copy but they're unlikely to go there. And then this part, which was about kind of the goals in your life, um, people kind of don't get that, what that's about. But you, as you can see, they process her face. Uh, they like the content over here. And this part of, was actually about swine flu. Um, and uh, very effective, something the target audience was interested in and that they had a good emotional reaction to. Um, let me talk briefly about a study we did for YouTube in Europe. So they were interested in answering a number of questions. Um, I, I would, if I had to boil down the core of their questions, I'd say it was down to how, was the, how were the videos on the site playing off advertising content? And this is a problem that television networks have also, which is when you have content that's engaging alongside advertising, there's a huge concern with advertisers that people are not paying attention to their advertising. Uh, and that's, that's a, obviously a problem that YouTube has, right? We're going to put ads up and everyone's going to be watching the video and they're not going to pay any attention to what we're doing. So, so we did a, a bunch of analysis for them and we created something we call a spotlight video. So this is a video that puts spotlights where a certain number of audience members are, in fact, emotionally engaged in what's going on. Yo, yo. Corsa with MP3 connection. <laughs> Discover Vauxhall. So this is good news, <laughs> right? Which is as people are scanning the site and looking for the videos they want to watch, the advertising placed alongside is actually is compelling enough to get people to come over and have a reaction to, to what's going on on the screen. And, um, and this is, this is sort of two layouts, so you can see it, it, it actually does have, have good balance. But there's actually was another interesting finding about this. Um, and, and I'll just throw up the data. And that is that people watching YouTube are more engaged. So their average level of emotional engagement is higher when they're on YouTube than when they're watching television. 
And that makes sense because if you think about it, YouTube's it's a it's a lean forward experience, right? You're navigating, you're clicking, you've got to be there, you've got to be active. It's not it's not a lean back experience when you're uh, sitting on the couch. Um, but what that means is, and uh, I'll, I'll sort of decompose this for you. This is this is basically the emotional engagement of people watching a a particular ad. Um, I'm only going to show one trace, but this is a, a pretty common effect. Which is so the blue one is they're watching on YouTube. And the orange one is they're watching on television. And what it is is, first of all, you can see they start higher, right? The blue line starts higher. People are starting out more emotionally engaged on, on YouTube. But what happens is they can dip lower. And this, is again, was something we saw across ads. In fact, um, uh, at least one of the ads performed extremely poorly on YouTube, even though it performed decently well on television. And so it would appear that what happens is you're much more distractible on the web, right? You have, you're more engaged, you have higher expectations, and so when things are not good, you, you tend to fall off a cliff. And my guess is you're, they're looking at other things and they're sort of thinking about what they can do next. And so that really creates a higher bar for what happens on the web. And this is just, you know, again, just kind of reinforcing that point that, um, that when people present on the web, the creative needs to be, frankly, more compelling. Um, I'll, I'll just briefly put up a summary of the points that we got out of that study. And, uh, or maybe perhaps I'll take a question first, sir. OK. I actually, I'm working with YouTube monetization. Excellent. And, uh, without giving anything away, um, <laughs> do you find that advertisers really want you to watch the entire ad on YouTube? Or are they happy if you watch 25% or 50%? Well, what, what they want is they want their branding moment, right? The question was, the question was you know, do, do, they want, do advertisers want people to watch the whole thing? Typically, they do because they have some trajectory for the ad that they want you to go through. I think advertisers are becoming more sophisticated about understanding, especially in a fast-forwarding environment, that they need to nail you early. Like, it was interesting looking at the data from the uh, TiVo study, right, where people were fast-forwarding. Basically, if people are not engaged in an ad within the first three to five seconds, they start fast forwarding. And it's the kind of thing where um, you basically lose about 20% of your audience. If, if your level's down 20%, you lose about 20% of your audience. I mean, it's a very striking effect. And so they want you to watch the whole commercial, but I think they're getting a lot smarter about realizing you may well not, and therefore they need to get their engagement in up front and get their message across. Okay. Did you have a question? Um, yeah. You, you show a strong emotional engagement with faces directly. Have you actually right. measured the difference between faces of people you already know and um, strangers' faces? Is that something you've looked at at all? Um, I haven't. This, this is where I wish our CEO was here, the psychiatrist, because my guess is that they have. Um, I actually don't, don't know that. Um, but usually things you're more familiar with, you have a, you have a higher engagement with. Right. But, but again, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so let me just let me just tell you some some of the results. Now, one of the things is is we did this we did this research with a company called OTX. So we did the emotional engagement part of the research, and OTX did all of the other parts of their research, um, including doing surveys of people um, after they watched this, surveys before and surveys after. And and these were the results from a whole bunch of studies, and I I don't have time to go through them all, but I thought this was very interesting, which is you know. People are more attentive to YouTube. That was something we measured. Um, and that this engagement leads to higher recall. So part of the test was testing people watching ads on television versus ads that they watch on YouTube. So this goes back to the thesis. If you're more engaged in something, you're more likely to remember it. Um, the third point really goes to this, this point of um, ads can have an impact in the context of other content. And if you're someone who sells advertising, this is very important, right? Advertisers want to know that their message is, get, is getting through. Um, and then the fourth point was something I, I didn't talk about much, but this was just one where essentially being on YouTube had a halo effect where when you measured people's attitude toward, towards the ads afterwards, if they'd seen them on YouTube, they thought they were basically more high tech, uh, more internet friendly, and all those kinds of things. So, so, so there's definitely some, some things going on there. But very interesting stuff, and, and really a good example of how you can use traditional research and emotional research together to um, really get a, a much broader perspective on what's going on with your consumers. 
Um, I'll just sort of wrap up here. First of all, if you're, if you're interested in this topic, um, there are a couple books that I, that I recommend. Uh, the book Habit by Neil Martin is really about how consumers get entrenched in their habits and potential ways of getting them out of their habits. Now, what we would say is the way to get people out of their habits is to create something that they're emotionally engaged in. You really have to push their emotional triggers. You've got to get in there in the limbic system and get them engaging both attentive to what you want them to do, which is new and different, and actually engaging in that behavior. But that's, a, that's kind of a short read, a good book. If you're interested in a much deeper view um, of how emotions play in the brain, and actually a lot of very interesting case studies on how people with emotional impairments have a huge amount of trouble with decision making. I mean, they literally have people where the emotional centers of their brain are damaged, and they'll go into supermarket, um, and, and they'll spend hours and never buy a, a single thing. Um, with perfectly wonderful recall of what they saw, why they were there, what they were doing, but, but essentially your emotions create a, a, a space where you can make a decision, right? If essentially what happens is you, you have an emotional feeling that I am making the right decision and you do something. It's like a shortcut. And so people who have emotional impairments actually have a huge amount of trouble with decision making. Um, the other thing I'll say about what we do is that um, we do a lot of stuff that is earlier stage. So, so if, it's, if it's basically where you've already spent the money, now, now we have worked with advertisers to rescue broken ad campaigns. So ones where they're in the market, it's not going very well, they're not seeing a pickup, they're not seeing a change in behavior, bring it back and we work with them. And um, we've actually gained some great insights from that in terms of what needs to be fixed and put stuff back out there. That's pretty interesting. But it really is working at these early stages. And one of the nice things about emotional engagement is we can work at these early stages. We can work at the, the animatic stage. We can work at the storyboarding stage, at the, at the rough cut stage. As long as your copy and you know, the design of your site and things like that are representative of what's going to be in the final product, we can gauge people's emotional reaction to that. And, and those improvements really go right to the, to the bottom line. So, so, so what's the value of all this you know, neuroscience stuff today? It's, it's really a focus on changing people's behavior. That's really the bottom line. If you want someone to adopt your product, if you want someone to pay attention to advertise and get the message, you need to emotionally engage them. One of the big advantages of the system is it's cross-cultural. So it doesn't require that you create a survey or surveys in multiple languages or those kinds of things. We've done testing all over the world. Um, and there are certainly cultures where asking questions, people will always say, you know, if it's a scale of one to five, where five is the best, they'll, you know, say everything's a four. Um, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to say that they don't like things. And this is something where you don't ask questions. You literally um, uh, just measure their brain as it's working. It's very useful for best practices. Again, how can you create, use faces, use relationships, things like that to get people emotionally engaged. The real focus here is on optimization. Um, we don't come up with brilliant advertising concepts. We don't come up with new products. What we do is we help people optimize the ones that are there and make the very best of it, again, starting from these early stages. We allow you to show value if you're someone who sells advertising, allow you to show value to advertisers, that people are emotionally engaged in the content, picking it up, and likely to change their behavior based on what's going on. And, and really, it's a first step of getting to why. You know, why is a product going to work? Why is a marketing campaign going to work? And why is it not? And, and neuroscience is at an early stage, but through this lucky accident of the vest and your limbic system and the changes that we can measure very efficiently and very inexpensively, um, this is the kind of stuff that can be available to people on a regular basis as they create new products and new media campaigns and launch them. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much.